Hello, I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. We at CSS are deeply saddened by the terrible events that took place on September 11th at the World Trade Center. We extend our sympathies to all whose families and friends have been touched. Along with other nonprofit organizations, CSS has launched emergency programs to reach out to working families and low-income New Yorkers whose lives have been affected by the World Trade Center attack. At CSS, we have rapidly created a safety net of programs. For today's edition of the Urban Agenda, we'll talk with CSS Vice Presidents David Campbell and Donna Fishman and Alina Molina, the Director of Voluntary Initiatives, who also had CSS's nationally recognized Retire and Senior Volunteer Program called RSVP. And we'll learn about these emergency programs for people in need. Well, David, what are we doing uh, uh, to help people who have gone through this kind of situation, uh, particularly in direct relief? We have a long tradition. Well, right after the disaster, of course, we had to think about how we could adapt our services to meet the needs um, of people who were affected by it. And the perhaps the most important service we have provided immediately is direct cash emergency assistance to individuals and families who have been affected. We provide cash assistance to um, any person who was directly affected by the World Trade Center disaster or who has been dislocated or unemployed as a result of the disaster. Now, what does emergency cash assistance mean? Uh, emergency cash assistance means any kind of need that um, an individual or family has as a result of the tragedy. It could be um, assistance with payment of rent. It could be uh, assistance with um, uh, food, clothing. We had some families who uh, were unable to return to their homes because of the disaster and we had to help them with clothing. But any kind of cash need that emerged as a result of the disaster. Can you give our viewers some kind of uh, feel for what, who's coming to us? What are they like? Well, it's really a cross-section of, of people, but um, we have heard a lot from low-income workers, from uh, building maintenance workers, from hotel workers who have been unemployed as a result of the disaster. Uh, one story that, uh, that uh, we've shared with folks involves a, a couple, one of whom was in uh, Tower 1 and one of whom was in Tower 2, both of whom escaped. Um, but were injured in trying to escape and then came to us for food assistance and rent assistance. Of course, they lost their jobs in addition to the simple trauma of having been uh, at the Trade Center the day of the attack. Well, I know direct assistance obviously go. We've been at this for 155 years, though not personally us. But we're doing some other things, particularly with uh, uh, trained volunteers and the rest, and I'll let Alina talk to some of that. But we're also trying to train uh, social workers and others who are um, having to deal head-on with some of these crises. Yes. One of the things that CSS, I think, is, is best at is public benefits training. As you know, there are many public benefits for which uh, poor people in New York are eligible. And the question we asked after the disaster are, what special benefits are people affected by the disaster eligible for? And at our Public Benefits Resource Center, we quickly learned about those benefits and set up trainings for social workers and organizations throughout the city um, to come to CSS and learn about those benefit programs so they can enroll anyone in the city who was affected by the disaster. Benefits such as disaster unemployment, um, there are new benefits around food stamps, extending food stamps, um, uh, public assistance, uh, any benefit uh, associated with the disaster. Alina, we're also doing stuff with volunteers. Uh, you had uh, the RSVP, Senior Volunteer Program. We have 9,500 uh, senior volunteers. I assume there's been an outpouring of interest on volunteers to help. There's been an outpouring of interest within our program and also, as you know, within the city. However, the needs for volunteers are very specialized and very specific, which is why hundreds of people that have come forward and wanting to help have been turned away. Our volunteers have been able to assist in a very specific and crucial job at the Family Support Center that have been established to help the victims, their families. Now, these, these were the ones the, the, the city and, and the federal government established? Yes. 
Yes, and all of the major relief efforts, the okay. American Red Cross, Safe Horizons. And our volunteers have been there working with particularly low-skilled workers that have lost their jobs in helping them to apply for those benefits that they qualify for. As David mentioned, unemployment insurance, um, immediate cash assistance. Um, they've seen many, many people in the short time that they've been involved with this because the need is really quite tremendous. Donna, we, you control our, our donors and uh, our contributors. Have we been hearing from them? How are they taking this tragedy, and what are, what are they asking for when they want to give help? Right. To? Well, you know, it, anybody who looks at the television or reads the newspaper sees the tremendous outpouring that people have made in trying to contribute to help the people who have been affected by this. We're really no different in that case. And in many cases, people have been supporters of Community Service Society for some time. And certainly, we're seeing an increased number of gifts that are coming in. Some of the gifts, this is really from the people who we generally write to and ask for support. Mm -hmm. We're getting um, letters that accompany these gifts saying, you know, we want to help. This is all I can do. I really want to be able to help people who have um, made it through this crisis and their families and so forth. Um, the, the challenge really is, is to try to figure out how can you best meet those donors' needs, those, the needs of the people who are contributing financial support to help people when there's still so much sorting out that's going on and there are so many um, groups of people who are collecting money to help people. Well, David, let's talk about that. We coordinate, obviously, with a number of other charities throughout the city of New York. That's part of the role we've always played. Uh, and we're obviously uh, part of the, the New York Times uh, September 11th fund effort. Um, what about coordination? How do, how do we make sure that uh, scarce resources aren't wasted here and how we make sure that people are getting the most help uh, that they can? Well, I think there are two ways you can look at it. First is uh, the immediate response to the disaster. There was created um, soon after September 11th a disaster relief infrastructure, if you will, a system through which people directly affected uh, by the disaster can uh, receive benefits. Alina um, mentioned the Family Assistance Center at Pier 94 that Safe Horizons, FEMA, Red Cross are all involved in. Anyone who was directly affected by the disaster should go to that uh, family assistance center. And that's really the first point of contact for anyone affected by the disaster. The, the challenge is uh, how we uh, uh, address the needs of those who are secondarily affected, people who've lost jobs who may not be eligible for other uh, public benefits for direct um, disaster victims. And that's more of a challenge. The second way I would look at this is to say we know today what people's emergency needs are mm. um, around housing, uh, assistance, around uh, food and clothing. In the longer term, all of the voluntary agencies that receive um, funds in response to this disaster will need to coordinate their efforts to ensure that those resources are used most effectively. We can't say today what that will look like six months from now, but we can say today that those organizations are already talking to each other about how to coordinate and distribute money effectively. Well, you and your staff actually have been looking at uh, what happened in other disasters elsewhere in the country and what the needs, turn, longer term needs, turned out to. I think Oklahoma City is the one we have talked about. Maybe we can What's talk been about most, that. what we've heard from the Red Cross about the Oklahoma City disaster, and uh, a point that I find very compelling is that here, six years after the Oklahoma City disaster, their family <coughs> assistance center is still open. And they tell us that they receive families every day in that family assistance center in Oklahoma City. Now, if you think about that, where there were 100, approximately 170 people who were killed in Oklahoma City and the over 5,000 people killed in New York, you can imagine that the needs will go on forever, for, or at least for a very long period of time. Um, the kinds of needs we imagine families, individuals and families will present will be there will be a long-term uh, question of employment. There will be clinical counseling needs for people who are experiencing trauma as a result of, of the disaster, um, things of that nature. Alina, we don't send our volunteers in cold. They have to obviously go through some extensive training because before they can really be of use. Uh, 
Can you describe how that works? Sure. Well, the volunteers that I mentioned earlier um, had already been trained through our ACES program, which stands for Advocacy Counseling Entitlement Services, and they went through a very rigorous and very comprehensive training on all the different types of government and public benefits mm -hmm. that people may qualify for, and had been deployed through various organizations um, in hospitals and community-based organizations to help people actually apply for any benefit that they may qualify for. We put out a special call among this group of volunteers volunteers uh, to see who might be um, interested in helping the relief efforts. As you might imagine, the interest was tremendous. Right. So in addition to the jobs that they were already performing, um, they were willing to come forward and help at the Family Assistance Center. So yes, the training is absolutely crucial to help them mm -hmm. really make a difference. Our, our, our volunteers are somewhat unique. Uh, they don't sort of fit perhaps the public's general perception of who volunteers are. What, what is an ACES volunteer? Where are they coming from? What, what generally uh, kind of life experience have they had? They're coming from all over the place. Probably the one thing that they have in common is absolutely no prior experience in working in this area, <laughs> but a <laughs> willingness to learn. Idea. And I think that um, very often we, we, don't, we think that learning ends at a certain age, and what I think we show through this program is that there's tremendous interest among the older adult population to tackle new projects and to learn new skills and um, to go through, uh, as I said, very, very extensive training to provide this particular service. But they are as varied as um, the, uh, the places they come from and their prior um, work experience. Donna, what do you think in terms of the longer term view of how we're going to coordinate uh, philanthropic efforts. Uh, what are we hearing in terms of how other other charities are dealing with this? It, I think there's some fear beginning to emerge that uh, if you're not particularly at, at ground zero here, mm. you may not be a charity uh, that should receive funds. Right. I, I, think, I think there's a lot that we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, there's been a lot of coverage of certainly how much money these various funds have raised, how the monies have come sort of uniquely from the corporate, the foundation, and the, you know, individuals themselves. I think that, um, you know, I was just at a meeting the other day where clearly some organizations that are used to sort of week-to-week -week income in the last four weeks have seen significant drop-offs. But it's not clear to me what's going to happen. I, I heard a story just the other day about how, in a sense, the sort of need to give, the need to do, has been now ingrained in all of our lives and sort of the need to think less about ourselves and what we're doing and more about other people. And perhaps that will sort of set the tone for how philanthropy might, you know, sort of work its way through our society over the coming six months. But, you know, it's really kind of hard. It's really too early to kind of call it and to tell mm -hmm. what's going to go on. David, let's talk about how uh, people end up at our door. Um, CSS is not a disaster relief agency. Um, we're reshaping our programs. How do, how do the, the victims, their families, uh, how do people who've lost their jobs because, as a result of this end up uh, with CSS? And which, which populations are we focusing on? Well, the very practical answer to that question is a phone number, which <laughs> I can give you. Uh, and uh, I'll put it at the bottom of the yes. screen. But anyone uh, uh, in need of financial assistance can call our, in our special intake number for, um, for financial assistance, 614-5566. But people come to us for um, safety net assistance, those needs that aren't met by the disaster relief infrastructure. And we've done special outreach to, um, uh, to special populations that have been affected by the disaster. Low-income workers, um, we've talked to the folks at, at Local 32 BJ. And that's what? What, what is 32? Local 32 BJ is the Building Service Workers Union. Oh, clean, yeah, cleaning, uh, yeah. Who, uh, uh, cleaning and maintenance staff right. who are working in buildings in Lower Manhattan. Mm -hmm. We've talked to representatives of the Hotel Workers Union, um, who have many of whom have lost their jobs as a result of, of the disaster, and we've done special outreach to them. So we have tried to identify special populations that have been affected by this disaster that might not be covered by the existing um, programs. What about the, the question of legal immigrants and undocumented immigrants? Uh, clearly, there's uh, some concern that many of them are working in and around the World Trade Center, and their coverage is, is somewhat less clear. Yes. 
For any um, financial assistance that CSS provides, we don't ask questions about legal status and we will provide um, uh, emergency financial assistance to anyone regardless of status. But I should say there has been an effort to educate the staffs at the Family Assistance Center uh, to ensure that uh, um, immigrants of any kind, documented, undocumented, undocumented, get the benefits that they are entitled to. There are some benefits for which they are entitled, some for which they are not. We will provide assistance regardless of status, but we also do encourage folks to receive benefits uh, that they are entitled to at the Family Assistance Center. And the immigration advocacy groups have been working closely at the Family Assistance Center to ensure that those needs are met and people are educated about what the benefits they're eligible for are. Now, the other thing uh, you were mentioning to me that we're starting to see a, an increase in the flow. This is almost, uh, this is a, quite a while after the actual incident. Why should we start to see increase in, in people coming into our, mm -hmm. our services now? If you think about um, the timing of the disaster um, and, and the kinds of needs that, pe the kinds of cash assistance needs people have, um, workers would have received paychecks that covered them for maybe the week or two after the disaster. Mm -hmm. And of course, a disaster of this magnitude does not immediately cause you to focus on your, on your uh, financial situation. You're worried about family, want to make sure that everyone's okay. We're seeing an increase now because people only now are not receiving the paycheck and only now are focusing on the financial needs that they're facing as, as uh, families. And so I think that's the reason for the increase. We'll be back to continue our program right after this. You don't have to like me. Or you can. <laughs> you don't have to run with me. You really don't have to run away from me. And we're not all that different. I like good food. Good music. I want a good job. I want my kids to live in a world where they are safe and loved and respected for who they are. You don't have to like me. But if you talk to me, you might. We can end prejudice if we talk to each other. Call. Call. Tell us what you'd do. Together we can build one America. We are talking with CSS Vice Presidents David Campbell and Donna Fishman and Alina Molina, the Director of Voluntary Initiatives at CSS. We've been talking uh, about the issue of uh, what we're doing immediately. Uh, but obviously there's some concerns, David, about what the future holds for the city of New York, particularly for poor and working people. Uh, what are we thinking about now on the policy side? Well, I think the most important thing is simply to ask that question. What about poor and low-income New Yorkers in a recession? Most of the focus has been around rebuilding New York's uh, finance infrastructure. Um, and we have to first think about poor and low-income New Yorkers. But the kinds of things that we've talked about at CSS are uh, can we create a jobs program to help so, uh, the many unemployed workers there are as a result of the Trade Center disaster? Can we strengthen the safety net? Because we know in the looming recession that's been exacerbated by the disaster, there's a greater need for safety net given the um, growing unemployment. What are the health insurance needs of those um, low-wage workers and those who are unemployed? Can we broaden the, um, uh, the eligibility for health insurance? And finally, we are also worried about housing. Um, will unemployed workers be at risk of losing their apartments? Can we do something about eviction prevention? So we are trying to focus on the needs of low-wage workers who are now unemployed in these areas. Do you get this, the sense that people understand how wide the ripples of this are going to go out? I mean, we're obviously starting to hear numbers of the immediate effects uh, led to the losses of everywhere from 75 to 150,000 jobs. But we're beginning to hear numbers, obviously, from the city controller and others, uh, that this may lead to one of the deepest uh, recessions in the city's history. Um, what, I what is the sense? Do people really understand what we're talking about? Well, I think, I, I don't think they do yet. A at this point, people are focusing on the impact of just this in Lower Manhattan, but they haven't recognized its impact on other industries, um, on the hotel and tourism industry, on the other industries that, that provide support for low-wage workers in New York City. And I don't think there is as yet a focus on how this recession will affect Though that population. Donna, what about philanthropy? I, I, I'm also hearing some concerns that this could be the end of the world in terms of philanthropic giving. After all the, the money comes out here, will there be anything left? Well, it's really kind of hard to tell. I mean, I think a lot of it depends on the economics of the city and the country and whether or not 
we're able to turn the stuff around a little bit. I, I, I also think that, in a sense, people um, are, you know, bombarded with stories of what's going on with folks. And I think that people are probably going to be interested in sort of investing their resources in how we can rebuild the city and what we need to do. I, I would be interested in seeing more press about, you know, how can we take this disaster and some of the you know, sort of effects it's had, as, as you've spoken about, you know, the unity that people have had, the sense that this is not a disaster that hit one economic mm -hmm. class of people or one geographic sector of people. I mean, this really hit everyone in New York City. It was extremely random. And can we sort of take that sort of new sort of unity that we have and turn it into a way to talk about rebuilding the whole city? You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that. Obviously, this disaster not only hit people in the five boroughs, uh, it hit the surrounding ring, mm -hmm. Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, Westchester, parts of Long Island, very terribly in terms of the actual uh, loss sure. of life. But it also raises the question, um, if the New York economy, because of this disaster, really sinks, do, does the entire region, the tri-state region, suddenly go into a, a deep recession? And whether we have to start looking more seriously now of this as a regional economy? Uh, that uh, just because someone leaves at the end of the day doesn't mean that we don't have to have some kind of reciprocal r arrangements and planning and taxation, all the things to keep this region vital so everyone can work. Um, I, you know, clearly there's been sort of a war. I'm a New Jersey person, you know, I don't want to pay taxes for New York, the rest. I'm wondering if this is the opportunity to start a new d dialogue on everything from how you rebuild the World Trade Center to how people should uh, look at the job market and the importance of having a central uh, core like Manhattan and, and other things, as well as, as the sort of re reciprocal uh, obligation. And we're, we're looking at that. I think we have to talk about that. And I think given you know, the expressions of, of sort of shared pain, that we may Absolutely. have the opening to have that discussion happen now. No, uh, no, we have. I mean, you know, as Zelina was talking about earlier, I mean, the outpouring of volunteers, it's not just people in New York City, it's not just your traditional volunteers. I mean, you know, you know, you, actually, you could speak to this better than I can. Yeah, I mean, it has been across the board the, the tremendous amount of interest right. um, in people coming forward. Our challenge will be to channel that interest. Um, to, in support of the work that was being done by the nonprofit sector before September 11th, uh, certainly is continuing now, and if anything, will increase um, because of the added needs that have come about from the disaster. Well, on the donor side, I must admit, I, I, I sign a letter thanking everyone who sends a donation to us. Uh, you know, and we get a lot, we've gotten a lot of $10 donations from California, from Texas all over the place. I mean, this notion of bringing, you know, New York as part of the, the overall America is a very powerful force mm -hmm. and clearly shouldn't be lost. I mean, uh, I think people get it in a way that sometimes the slamming of New York as not really being part of the sort of the rest of the country or New Yorkers feeling somehow superior here. This is an opportunity, obviously, to break through on, on many of those challenges. Uh, though I must admit, in my, my first uh, uh, hearing, uh, there's a bit debate that's brewing in Congress as to where the relief money should go. And it really hasn't focused on the low-wage people we're talking about, no, primarily. I mean, so far, the focus has been on economic revitalization, um, which I understand to mean uh, rebuilding the, um, the, the industries that were hurt by this uh, uh, attack and not yeah. recognizing that uh, those industries depend on low-wage workers mm -hmm. and, and that we need to invest in the needs of those low-wage workers as well. Well, it's interesting. I, you know, the, how this city rebuilds is going to be a critical, uh, first of all, in how successful it is. Um, what I'm uh, interested for not-for-profits uh, like our own is clearly mobilizing people uh, to help in, t in, in this time of tragedy is, is something that we think may be one of the only things that helps New York get through this. Uh, the volunteer energy, the ability to come in and take over the slack even in times of real scarcity. If the city's budget, uh, as has been projected, sees deficits as huge as $5 billion or more, uh, we're going to have to see volunteer action. Uh, filling in some of the roles in schools and, and parks and the rest in a way uh, perhaps we've never seen before. Um, and that kind of uh, energy is something that I think uh, I've been very pleased to see. People get it. Um, 
And I don't think New Yorkers uh, should be at all ashamed about how this, uh, this sort of emotionalism that's coming out, where people demand that you listen to them first. Uh, before they start, and getting hugged quite surprisingly um, by people who you know only peripherally. I think people are working towards a new kind of, a kind of uh, integration. You know, I would say, David, uh, that in the voluntary sector, you see already a great deal of uh, community among them and, and, and a singularity of purpose. My thanks to all of our guests today. New York City today uh, is a community in mourning. And yet we have seen how people of all races, economic status, and political views have come together. The days ahead will surely prove difficult for our city, as so many of our fellow New Yorkers try to rebuild their lives in the face of this tragedy. We must work harder than ever to reach out to all New Yorkers in need. I'm David R. Jones of the Community Service Society. Thank you for joining us for the Urban Agenda. Comment on the Urban Agenda or for more information on CSS, contact Community Service Society of New York, 105 East 22nd Street, New York, New York, 10010, area code 212-254-8900.